That scene, though, is so powerful because when Snape looks into Harry Potter's face, he's the Griffin. And yet, he's the resolution of contraries, like the God Man is, because he's got the star, and then Snape understands what the star is. He's Gryffindor and slippery resolved. He's the resolution of contraries. And when he looks into those green eyes and sees the eyes of his beloved and says, look at the snake entered to the has finally transcended all of his hatred, all of his bile, all of his memories, and he's died sacrificially for Harry Potter and for his community. And Snape earns his reward. It's a magnificent finish. I love that story. Does it have anything to do with the question we're talking about today? No. <laughs> but it's a great piece. It's not, anyway, um, it does not tell us about why this is real in the But Keep in mind the, the Dante and the state connection seeing Christ through corrected vision. And Harry has a Christ vision. All right. Now John's prayer. I said, what, what, what are the eyes? And John said, don't do our eyeball, John. Let's get right to it. And that is probably the most important eyeball in this series. All the other eyeballs we reflect on that. If you know the, the ring composition of the books, these, whenever the story opens, I, I think it's in uh, Apple and Prince, correct me if I'm wrong here, opens up with Harry sleeping against the window with his eyes and skew, whatever. It's exactly the image of Dumbledore dead at the end of the book. The way we open up the story of Harry is a, is a picture of the end because it's a ring composition. You're going to see the end lead up, you're going to see a pivot in the center. I'm writing a wonderful post about this Robert Professor Tunin. Um, the opening of the Hallows has Harry bleeding after having touched a mirror shard. All right? So we got a point that blood is really important, so we need to know that. Um, <laughs> and it has something to do with this mirror. And mirrors have yeah, mirrors are an important point. Point. Yeah. <laughs> um, Harry's cut tells us. And him to pay attention. Let's read that bathroom passage. Bathroom, better passage. There is the bathroom being his Harry sat down hard on the bed. Remember, he just read the, the uh, he just yelled lies at the daily the prophet, the, the horrible things that he excerpted from readers of the book. Harry sat down hard on the bed. The broken bit of mirror danced away from him. He picked it up and turned it over his fingers, thinking, thinking of Dumbledore and the lies with which Peter Skeeter was the man. A flash of brightest blue. Harry froze, his cut fingers slipping on the jagged edge of the mirror again. He had imagined it. He must have done. Look at that imagination. He glanced over his shoulder, but the wall was a sickly peach color of Antonius choosing. There was nothing blue there for the mirror to look at. He peered into the mirror of fragment again and saw nothing but his own bright green eye looking back at him. He had imagined it. There was no other explanation. Imagined it because he had been thinking of his dead hat master. If anything was certain, it was that the bright blue eyes of Albus Dumbledore would never pierce him again. So we begin the book with Harry Potter, essentially a materialist. He denies. He starts off by saying this happened inside his head and it was delusional. Even though he saw it with his sense of perception, he denies the sense of perception and says it's delusional. What we should know here, three quick notes. One is, is the joke. It's a joke here. Harry looks into a mirror and sees an EYE where his capital I should be. Right? <laughs> now that's a joke, folks. <laughs> I still have that enough. He should be looking for his eye. He sees an eye. I love it. It's <laughs> okay. actually a reference to Jonathan Swift's Battle of the Books, where I think it's Virgil from the, the traditionalists are battling with the moderns inside the Dublin Library. And Virgil, or one of the heroic characters, throws his spear at Descartes. And Descartes takes it oh, right in the eye. <laughs> Why would Descartes catch a spear in the eye? What is, what is this famous phrase? I'm thinking of the great. The great individualistic solipsism. And Swift is no fan of Descartes, obviously. <laughs> and the eye was his, his ego. Oxen dead. Okay. Read that book. That is pretty funny. Uh, 
This jarring encounter with the eye slash eye should move us to reflection on the eye. Now, remember the eye, capital I, is a very weird word. In fact, some people believe that it is a proof in itself of the existence of God. I kid you not. C.S. Lewis calls the pronoun I a, a, a sacred name. A sacred name. Now, uh, and to get that, you have to understand that most words have a single reference. If you had a word that meant eggplant, elephant, and elevator simultaneously, this would be not a very valuable word, right? Because you'd ask for you know, an eggplant sandwich, whatever, a guy would bring you an Otis elevator. I mean, this would be very awkward and confusing for part of an elephant. No. Um, words should have single reference so that people don't get confused about what you're talking about. But when I use the word I, nobody gets confused. If I say, I'm going to the store, John doesn't say, no, I'm not. He doesn't think I means me. It can't mean you. He understands that this I is a reference to all these things that we share. Now this, this gets pretty tricky. This, there's, a, there's a transpersonal sense of the I that we get. This bizarreness of I is a noun. It's indefinite and a different, indefinite number of different reference without confusion. It's evidence of a common transpersonal self and of an immaterial reality. I don't make too much of that, but you should know that, that the reason Lewis calls that a sacred name is that he believes that the I is the conscience. Now the word conscience, if you break it down into its Latin parts, whatever, means a shared knowing. So that I can talk about I, you understand it, meaning me rather than you or whatever, is because we all have a shared knowing, a conscience. Obviously, my conscience is not me. It's usually just talking to me about me. Um, if it were me, it would give me a free pass all the time. Um, instead, he usually says, you know, you shouldn't talk to your wife about it. I do that. Uh, that, that conscience is something which is not me that talks to me about that, and we all share it. But then you should know that the, uh, the Greek word for conscience is something that comes from sunego, which means a shared vision, okay? a, a common eye. That your conscience is a, is a shared way of seeing things from above, which is not limited to our accidental personal ego So when Harry looks into the mirror where his eyes should be, and he sees an eyeball staring back at him as Albus Dumbledore's eyes of all things, we should be saying to ourselves, wow, who is Harry Potter that when he goes into a mirror and sees an eye? And an eye was just somewhat like a conscience. The importance of the mirror, if, if there's a foundation to English fantasy literature, it's a man named Samuel Taylor Coleridge. He was not only a great poet, but he was uh, one of the most profound natural theologians in English history. Um, uh, Boston theologians like Maurice. <coughs> Newman, Catholics, all, all, you know, took the plan before Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the giant. And one of the things that, that Coleridge made clear in his writings, and Coleridge made anything clear in his writings, it's pretty, it's pretty difficult, is that, is that the, the base of all knowledge, he said, the base of all knowledge is the coincidence of subject and object. All right, this is the hardest thing I'm talking about tonight. So, wait, 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 wait. This is hard. This is hard stuff. The coincidence of the, the base of all knowledge is the coincidence of subject and object. Well, that's weird. So you have to get the coincidence of subject and object into a mirror. Right? That's the only place in nature, you know, whatever kind of mirror, you know, you know, a reflection pond or whatever an actual mirror, where you look into the mirror and the subject and the object are the same. Right? Me, known subject, looks into the mirror, the known object is the same as the known subject. Coleridge right? says all knowledge is the coincidence of those two things. Now this is, this is come back to this, this is tricky, but it has to do with that mirror. And why mirrors is such a big thing in fantasy literature. I want you to note though, right, right the story's beginning, that Harry is a skeptical materialist. His certainty of never seeing Dumbledore makes him conclude that his sense perception is wrong, not real. Just in his head, that it's a magic, that it's delusion. His denial 
of the I-I reflection is here a denial of his transpersonal self beyond his ego and his ability to transcend death. He denies that he will ever see Dumbledore again. There is no life after death. And I could not have seen what I saw in that mirror because I can only see in that mirror what is naturally reflected in it. My I, capital I, is only my external reality. Now, we see the mirror again just before Harry Potter denies Dumbledore's love for him, which is the nadir of the alchemical negret, where he says that Dumbledore, just remember that, Hermione's, Hermione's busted his wand, he's, he's had the nightmare with uh, Nagini, the exploding woman, a dead woman. This is, this is kind of the gruesome part of the house. Can't wait for the CGI in the movie. <laughs> Stay through that school. I wonder how much of this last book was written for Warner Brothers. Okay. When, when she made the room requirement to turn into an area large than Hogwarts for that final theme fire scene, I think it's about, this is going to cost them a billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, totally great. Gary's gone through the worst of it. He denies Dumbledore's love for him. Never told me any, anything I need to know, etc. And he denies Dumbledore completely. But still, he keeps the mirror in the most in bad as, as a token of his godfather. The eye appears, appears again in the Malfoy Manor base. The critical scene in the Malfoy Manor base, one of my favorites. And more because of Ron. Ron, in the beginning of the book, when, when Luna comes in and Luna dances with herself, the wedding, what, is, what does Ron say about Luna? Great. She always gives great value, right? Well, Ron, he really always gives great value, right? In the moment of crisis, the Malfoy Manor basement, what does he do? He runs wall to wall, screaming your mind's name. <laughs> very much. Very much. Really contributing to all the good things that I do. I'm sure it was really comforting to her upstairs because he tortured her. Good. Someone downstairs scares enough me to <laughs> At least Harry doesn't just get good value. Harry, Harry, you know, her mind screams, echoed up the walls upstairs. Ron was half sobbing as he counted the walls with his fist. Very helpful. And Harry, in her desperation, seized. Hager's pouch around his neck and broke inside. He pulled out Dumbledore's sticks and shook it, hoping for he did not know what. Nothing happened. He waved the broken halves of the Phoenix wand that they were lifeless. The mirror fragment fell sparkling to the floor and saw the name of the lightest. Dumbledore's eye was gazing at him out of the door. Help us! He yelled in mad desperation. We're the silver of Malfoy Manor! Help us! The eye blinked and was gone. Harry was not even sure that it had really been there. He tilted the shard of the mirror this way and that, saw nothing reflected there but the walls and the ceiling of the prison. And upstairs, Hermione was screaming worse than ever, and next to him, Ron was bellowing, like, Hermione, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, this is an odd one. I mean, I was in the room for over six years, and there's a saying there, it's kind of cliche, if you joke about it, there are no atheists in white books, right? And there are no atheists in the mouth of Harry. When, when you see the, the magical blue eye appear to you there, you don't say to yourself, no, 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 no eye all here. <laughs> Harry falls back into the second year, and you know, there'll always be help for those. And he said, no. <laughs> and Dumbledore delivers. Not the Dumbledore that he thinks, but Dumbledore delivers. Harry throws a Hail Mary pass. <laughs> Dolly appears and uh, saves the day. I like Dolly. I, 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 I have a certain facial similarity with Dolly. So. <laughs> 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 she's saving it. I mean, before his decision in the, in the Malfoy Manor cellar and Dolly's afraid to believe, Harry had twice refused people telling him that he had to choose to believe. Remember, Dog Breath Doge tells him to believe, and he says, what? And then Hermione says, you've got to believe, Harry. You've got to believe Dumbledore. Just trust in him. Now, this to Harry is absolute nonsense. Harry is Harry's, you know, an empiricist. He's told us that. You don't believe anything you can't know for sure. He carries a Occam's razor in his pocket, you know? <laughs> he's not that bright, but he's, he's anomalous. And he says, you know, he says, basically, how can you choose to believe something? Here, John said to me, no, believe we're at Hogwarts, John, you're a beautiful family.